Good morning, everyone. And if you can't hear me, please let Brian or Carrie know as we go through, but I'll make sure I speak loud enough, hopefully, that you can hear. Um, what I'm going to talk about in this next section, just given the volume of questions we've had uh, with regards to what's going on in the field with, with ear mold and potential for mycotoxins, I think we need to actually take a step back a little bit and make sure we're all on the same page in terms of identification and understanding some of the risk. And the risk here could potentially be mycotoxins, and it could also just be airborne dust particle issues at the harvest time with some of these more as a nuisance. So there's some variation in that, in that risk that we have to think about, but it really starts with good identification. And if we look at this next slide coming up, here are some various examples. Some of these are not from this year. We'll talk more specifically about 2009 in particular. And I think if you're going off a of field identification for some of these ear molds, a few of them, say like the Diplodia here in, in what would be the lower uh, right of the slide, that's a little more identifiable than some of these others. Uh, right next to it in that bottom plate is one that I think many of you would think you're seeing this here. This is actually a trichoderma, but it would look very much like some of the things we're seeing in the field with the early freeze going on, some of the secondary pathogens that way. So I think the point here is you can see a lot of different symptoms out there, and we'll walk through each of the potential ear molds a little bit so you can understand some of what you're going out to see. Our ultimate recommendation is going to be to submit a sample, and we'll talk about the Team Grains ear mold survey going on right now at the end to submit a sample to get the proper identification. Because again, we're talking about different forms of risk down the road versus mycotoxin or just a nuisance and, and what the elevators may do to deal with some of this. So the outline, some of the current observations, we'll go specifically through some of the main ear molds we would see, a uh, little bit on mycotoxins and a lot of resources. As you see, this is, again, not a Wisconsin centric issue in 2009. This is occurring throughout the north central region. But what we're seeing in terms of the ear molds are going to vary by where you are in part of that region. So some of the current observations, and I need to thank my colleague at Iowa State, Allison Robertson, who provided this upper left photo. You see actually two things going on in that upper left plate. One is the cladosporium, which we're hearing more and more reports of. But if you look at that lower photo of the year. That's actually from a hail damage field, um, and that's one of the concerns we have to deal with in some situations is the hail damage. And what's going on there is starting to be trichoderma. Again, these are both secondary organisms that come in under stress, and the mycotoxin risk is negligible in those cases. The year in the upper right is one we pulled from a study of ours that was under hail damage, but this would be your classic more gibberella. Really, that year was tightly bound. In there, we could see the pinkish kernels. And in the lower right, that cladosporium sort of symptomology, a very fine uh, sort of dust-like look to it on the surface can actually wipe it off fairly easily. Based on a lot of the observations, myself, others, Joe Lauer has some excellent observations that are starting to make some sense. You have to look in terms of the hybrid, the planting date, your other field history information, the soil type tillage, fungicide application, was there insect mechanical or hail damage? And when did these events occur? All of these will come in to play as we go through that way. So let's walk through some of the ear rots in particular. So we'll start with Fusarium ear rot because I think this one is one that we need to think about, and it's a yearly occurrence on a lot of these ears. So it's not something we think of as a major epidemic year in and year out, but it does have risk to go with it. The symptoms are going to vary. These photos here illustrate that concept very well. You don't always have a symptomatic kernel. It's going to depend on genotype, what environment, and what the disease severity was, and the timing of all these events coming together. Most common, the Fusarium ear rots are going to be individual or groups of infected kernels that are scattered randomly on the ear. We look, hopefully, for a whitish pink to lavender growth on kernels. A starburst symptom is also very common, and there's a lot of photos out there if you just type that into a search engine to help pull that up if you're not sure what that really means. Uh, growth frequently associated with physical damage uh, to the ears, and so it's going to 
most often start at the tip, but again, a very random and scattered pattern. And again, just want to reemphasize, it can be asymptomatic. And we see this a lot in many of our other cropping systems. If most people are familiar with fusarium head scab and wheat, we think of about asymptomatic kernels uh, there as well with some of the different uh, pathogens we deal with. I moved up Cladosporium ear rot because it is popping up a lot. It's really associated, I think, this year heavily with the frost damage and the early freeze. This is a secondary organism. Um, I'm seeing reports, that photo in the lower right, all those ears are Cladosporium. That's coming from Iowa as an example, so it's not just here. Um, that's probably the most uh, severe set of symptoms I've seen for Cladosporium coming through. I've looked at some of the samples into the clinic. These are dark greenish black blotched or streaked kernels. So again, very diverse. And I think if you're going with field identification and you're familiar with something like trichoderma, in the field they look the same. We have to look under the microscope to get a better idea. They have different spore types. It's actually very easy to do that way. But in a field, you're not going to be able to see some of that. These are going to be scattered across the ears. And I think most people walking the field have seen this. When ears are completely colonized, they can be dark and lightweight. And again, I think this year why we're seeing it is the frost damage is the key one coming up. The early freeze brought this on quite a bit. Gibberella ear rot, uh, this is the same organism that causes fusarium head blight in wheat. So we also think about that one in our rotation concept. As you can see, here's some different examples of infected ears. If you look through the photos that way from that tight whitish pink top to a less more pinkish defined, but not necessarily the long, the big white uh, growth we would see there. The ears I see where we deal with this, again, the husk seems bound very tight to that ear. You have a lot of moisture in there, and it's, it's, it's similar to what we'll talk about with the diplodia almost glued together. In the literature, it's also known as red rot. Um, again, we think of it at the tip growing down into the ear. If infection is early, and early is a relative uh, statement here, the entire ear may rot and have the pinkish mycelium. Again, that husk tightly adheres. Uh, adheres to it. That example I showed a few slides back would be an, an example of that that was in hail damaged areas. Typically rare to see the entire ear colonized. So in most of the fields, you're not you're going to see some of the tips with discoloration and not necessarily the whole ear being infected. Diplodia ear rot. I bring this up because I think we are getting reports of it, but. The, the volume of reports are much more widespread from states south of Wisconsin this year. The I states in particular are where we're getting a lot of reports, also down into Kentucky. It's a big problem. Cool, wet conditions all year have really favored Diplodia taking off. Um, it's a thick white mold that usually starts at the base, so that's how you can differentiate it potentially from the gibberella. Also the coloration differences. The infected kernels really do appear glued to that husk when you look at them. And I think these examples uh, that we can see here on the slide would illustrate that if you think of the field settings. Ears are going to be shrunken, lightweight, and probably turn grayish brown. Uh, if you break an ear and look closely, you can see little black specks on that. That's black pycnidia. We will see that on the kernels, on the cobs, husk. And actually, Diplodia can cause a stock rot, and you will see these fine black specks. They're kind of raised pustules are, um, on the stalk as well. So in very severe situations, you can see it throughout the entire plant. Another one that I think, again, going back to identification is key. Here's some examples of trichoderma ear rot. It's a secondary organism. Last year, we dealt with some samples, actually, um, what makes trichoderma interesting is it's such a rapid colonizer, you have a hard time identifying anything else in the laboratory with it. But the hail damage, that example to the right, uh, injury is a big key to get this pathogen started and kind of the infection process started. So more, I would expect more cases of trichoderma popping up maybe in the southwestern part of the state where we've had hail damage this year. Again, this is an example from my colleague at Iowa State. We see bright green to dark bluish green fungal growth. So if you think of the cladosporium, they're kind of similar on and between the kernels. Again, similar to cladosporium, 
often covers the entire ear. An injury is usually something we look for in these situations. So the laboratory diagnostic can be a way. The good thing is we're talking about an ear rot here from a mycotoxin perspective. We're not even concerned about it. It doesn't produce mycotoxins. One that does pop up in uh, penicillium ear rot occasionally. We haven't seen too many examples. We are hearing some reports. Infectious typically occurs where ears are damaged. Uh, it'll be powdery green or blue fungal growth on and between kernels, most often at the tips because that's where we think the damage occurring initially. The infected kernels can become streaked or bleached, so that's a differentiator from maybe the cladosporium where we would look for black kernels. In grain stored at high moisture, uh, it can result in a, what's termed blue eye or a blue discoloration of the embryo. And I want to reiterate, we've written about some of the silage issues and the hail damage setting earlier, uh, myself with Joe Lauer and Dan Undersander. We're talking about different species from the common fungus and silage. So from the mycotoxin perspective, we have a different situation going on here. So again, you know, think about these, get a proper identification to make the next decision. I'm going to move into mycotoxins a little bit. We're not going to... Um, spend a lot of time because I think we'll emphasize the testing procedures and I, you know Randy Shaver will talk about some of the feed related issues as we move forward with that. I just want to bring in, provide an introduction because I think we need to dispel some of the, the myth with molds versus mycotoxins a little bit. There are a lot of mycotoxins. These are toxic substances produced by these fungi growing on grain feed or food in the field or in storage. They're going to be highly dependent, their development on the environment, factors that caused wounding, where were resources high or limiting, things that put stress on that plant. The one constant we think of for molds in general, high kernel moisture favor their development. Uh, wet conditions, they, they need water to do a lot of what they do, and an oxygen requirement. The key points, the presence of a mold on an ear, does not equal mycotoxin. And I think I'm, I, I, I say that very strongly for the simple fact that proper identification is one key, but you can't just make an assumption you have mycotoxin in there at that point. Similarly, no mold does not equal no mycotoxin, and we know of asymptomatic situations. So keep these all in mind. Um, we list at the end a lot of laboratories which offer testing for mycotoxins. We're going to focus on the Fusarium, Gibberella Z, and uh, a little less on Aspergillus because we haven't had conditions for aflatoxin development uh, in particular this year. There are many types of mycotoxins. We're not going to go through this slide uh, specifically. We do talk about it in the A3646 Pest Management Guide. So uh, I referenced Table 217 where you can look this up more specifically. You're going to have to look up some of these outside of that if you think there's a risk. And I've seen some initial reports coming in, and Ted Bay provided one sample that he had tested. At least initially, some of the, that's a sample size of one, but uh, the mycotoxin screen, from what I could tell, was all under the detectable level. So that's a good thing going on right now in some of the fields. But I do recommend having it tested if you're concerned. The slide I'm showing right now, these are, I borrowed from a publication at Iowa State, which are borrowed from the FDA guidelines, a summary from fumonisins and vomitoxin uh, levels. I bring this up because the elevators, were, we have an elevator-related issue and then the ethanol plant-related issue. Ethanol plants will be testing for mycotoxins, and I spoke with a couple of them. You need to you need to contact that plant specifically because their threshold levels may be lower than what the FDA levels are for the simple fact of that process to create the biofuel uh, will concentrate some of these mycotoxins. So they will be testing much more. My initial conversations with uh, grain storage uh, elevators, I think they're still trying to decide what they're going to do in some situations. They're having a hard time dealing with some of this wet grain and getting it dried down even having an example where they can see water being pushed out the bottom with the wet grain. Uh, so again, you're going to have to look in your local areas and contact them specifically on some of these things. Management, Nick brought it up. I mean, 
prioritize your field, but harvest as soon as possible. Removing fines um, in the grain is a good idea because we want to avoid hot spots where we get these little air pockets in there. Getting that dra gra grain dried down to 15% is good. Uh, no practical methods for de decontamination per se, but I think separating uh, fields that are at risk from your quality grain is a good idea. Um, if the levels are not high, if you had testing on farm blending may be an option. Uh, test field grain for mycotoxin. I think all grain should probably be tested for animal feed. That's my personal belief. And again, look at who your target is. We provided some of this information based on questions that have come up outside of the dairy operations also. Uh, one of the last slides here, a lot of resources out there. I'm not going to go through this in detail from uh, the team grains information, some of the previous information being written, uh, Wisconsin specific throughout the field. And as you can see, I provide a lot of regional references specifically targeting the ear mold situation. As you can see, it's not just here in Wisconsin. So these all provide very good information if you're trying to get a better field for which ear molds you're dealing with in the field. Some concluding thoughts. We've touched on the grain elevators a little bit. Um, look closely at your field histories. We're seeing differences depending on hybrid and or planting date. Uh, in our hail damage situations, the timing of the event could have an effect. Proper identification is going to be important. And here's the link for the Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic. And in terms of mycotoxins, I take this out of our A3646. Table 216 is the directory of the labs accordingly. Contact the lab specifically for how samples should be prepared and what they offer. Some do full screens that are quantitative. Others may just do a simpler uh, yes-no screen. So look at this list. Contact them directly, especially for how to prepare your samples. The last slide here for UW Extension, this is our ongoing ear mold survey being run by Team Grains and UW Extension. Um, uh, contact your county agent if you have questions about this or if they haven't mentioned it. They're doing all the sample collection for processing right now with our current budgets. We're handling the first 100 samples that come in, trying to get a, a range across the state, though. So fewer samples from a county with more counties is our goal.